Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. We're very excited to have you here and to help you get your playbook all in order going into the second half of the year. Uh, before we get started, um, I have a few housekeeping rules to go over. Um, this is being recorded. Um, you will have access to the recording um, in the next 24 hours. Um, also, we want this to be an interactive webinar, so please feel free to post any comments and or questions in either the chat box or the q and I'll be keeping an eye on it and we'll get those um, answered at the end of the webinar. So now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's presenters. Uh, we have MJ Shore, who has been a part of the MSP industry for over 20 years and has been a part um, of every aspect of what you can think of. He owned his own MSP for almost 10 years before selling it off and taking on more of a leadership roles through various companies, um, including CompTIA, which he is now the executive director of CompTIA's ISAL group and is the founder and principal consultant for MJ Shore LLC. We also have Neil Bradbury, who is the VP of Strategic Partnerships for us at Barracuda, who has also been a part of the MSP industry for over 15 years. He is an eight-time channel chief and is the chair of CompTIA's IT security community. So as you can see, we have a lot of knowledge, um, a lot of backgrounds, a lot of expertise with us here today. So it's my pleasure now to hand it over to Neil. Setting the bar kind of high there, Aaron, with all of our introductions. I hope that we can, uh, MJ and I can deliver. MJ, we'll do a quick sound check. Are you good there? I'm good, but I just want to, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. The only thing I'll clarify is I own my own MSP for almost 20 years, not just two. <laughs> <laughs> it probably felt like 50, depending on the day that you were having when you own the MSP, but. Uh, uh, yeah, you could say, I, I, had, I had a, uh, I like to say I had an Afro when I started and I'm bald as can be now. I think if you compare our headshots with the hair, um, I think you can tell that you owned an MSP for many, many years. <laughs> awesome. Well, let's get into this. You know, uh, MJ and I will attempt to keep this kind of a dialogue versus just a PowerPoint presentation that we deliver everyone that's in attendance. Um, we will take questions at the end. If you, if you have a question that you think is applicable to a slide, you know, uh, throw it into the chat or the, the Q&A and um, we'll do our best to kind of uh, answer it as we go through if we have a slide that addresses that. Um, as I always say with all these webinars, you're not going to memorize it all, but if you can gain one tip or trick uh, that you can use in your business or me even just one reminder of something that you know you should be doing but you're not, you know, this was a worthwhile endeavor for everyone on here. Uh, and again, we, we thank all the Barracuda partners on the, uh, on the line for attending this webinar. So Aaron, let's hit the next slide and let's talk a little bit about the current cybersecurity landscape. I'm sure everyone in attendance today knew what we would start this with, which is COVID-19. Um, you know, it is the new normal um, that we've kind of been watching over the last few months. Um, no matter where you are in the country or even the world, you know, you're being affected by this. Our, our customers and, and partners are for sure. Um, a few, you know, headlines of, of different things that are hitting uh, ourselves and our customers, you know, um, hackers, I mean, they're using literally uh, or correlating uh, the states that are doing more testing with actually the amount that are being spearfished right on the hacking side, which is insane, right? If you think about that, and we'll talk about how the impact to the health uh, care organization is being hit by COVID. Um, you see scams in the form of donation um, requests coming through. Uh, you see uh, 2000, this one here, 2000 malicious COVID-19 domains are created every day. I, I don't need, I mean, whew, that's some automation right there, right? Um, and then you end up seeing that there's the opposite, right? Which is where volunteers are creating a block list for 26,000 COVID-19 threats. I feel like, you know, if we were to go back a year or so, there would be the wanna cry or there would be some of the other uh, threats that we would be presenting on. For me, when I look at this in the new normal, it's the sheer time that we have been in this, this phase, right, of, of tracking um, the new normal and, and all the different threats that are coming in, especially in an election year, which we'll talk about. Aaron, let's hit the next slide. So with Barracuda, you know, we're in, uh, very big in email, you know, we're processing 
um, billions of e uh, you know half a billion billions of emails a week um, or, or, or a month there uh, almost I will get you the number if, um, that, that we get and we are seeing a ton a ton a ton of um, brand impersonation, blackmailing, uh, business email compromise and scamming. And, and the interesting thing with this is this has actually ch changed over um, the last kind of couple of months as we've been through this new, this new normal. Um, the amount that have gone into say the blackmailing or the brand impersonation has kind of increased and the scamming itself has gone down. Um, a couple of different things you know, that we're seeing on the Barracuda Research uh, criminals are pretending to sell coronavirus cures or face masks, you know, or even asking for investments in fake companies claiming to be developing vaccines. Um, you're seeing donation requests for fake charities, which is horrible, but they're doing it, um, you know, and, and looking to kind of um, say they're researchers, you know, again, taking advantage of, of coronavirus. And then we even saw some that are, you know, the World Health Community, right? And we know that it's actually the World Health Organization but they're trying to, uh, to scam money and donations in Bitcoin um, for those. So, you know, if you're interested in some of our other research, you know, you can point your favorite web browser over to um, our Barracuda blog. You know, our CTO posts pretty regularly on the different things that we're seeing from the, from the research side. Aaron, let's go to the next slide. You know, he, here's a, a chart of kind of the phishing attacks that, that we are seeing um, out, of, out of our product for uh, you know coronavirus COVID-19 related you know unfortunately scammers are probably unlikely to invest the time and effort if they weren't successful so we know that they're being successful um, one of the sources that a lot of the community looks at is you know the Verizon uh, data breach incident report you know 93 percent of the data breaches that are successful are actually coming in through social engineering attacks um, that are focused right they're becoming more targeted more personalized Think of everyone that has, you know, a LinkedIn profile or some type of public information that can very easily be uh, used to make something personal, especially when you talk to your customers uh, on the emails that they're getting. Even family members, you know, I know every MSP can relate to this where you get the email from the client or the customer that says, is this a virus? Well, why would you send it to me, number one? Uh, but, but, you know, and you have to go through and you have to look, but family members have been doing that to me over the last couple of months too with, hey, is this real? Is this not real? Um, and I'm sure you all go through that on a daily basis. To top this all off, you know, you start to see um, we've all gone remote, right? We're pro how many of us right now on this webinar or even presenting this webinar or in, in our, you know, uh, remote office, AKA our home, trying to do this. We sent everyone from the offices back to their houses. Um, and that itself uh, makes people a little bit more distracted when they're maybe looking at their email, they're not as vigilant, but um, it adds a whole nother element to this, this whole uh, th threat landscape that we're working through. Next slide. And so what we'll talk about is, is what to um, expect next. Um, what I will do is, you know, let's hit the next slide, Aaron. And then, you know, MJ, you heard me go through a lot of the different current threat landscape, what's happening. You know, is that what you're hearing as you do some of the consulting with MSPs and, and kind of uh, talking to industry peers? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, the amount of phishing is just off the charts. I mean, I've seen, I saw one stat that indicated that, that, um, Overall, there's something like a 613% increase in the type in malicious activity online right now, all being driven by the pandemic because it's just created just a you know target rich opportunity for the bad guys with so many people working from home with so much being done remotely. Um, you know, just last week the FBI put out an alert that mobile banking is under heavy attack because they've seen a 50% increase in the number of people using mobile banking since January. Um, you know, add in, add in to the pandemic, the, the racial strife, and it's no secret that nation states, primarily Russia and Iran, are trying to stoke the, uh, the tension and, and amplify the, the, the racial tensions in this country. So, you know, I think one thing that that MSPs aren't really um, in tune with is that that these aren't just hacker threats; these are existential threats. I mean, th these are threats coming from 
highly, highly organized groups that oftentimes tie back to nation states or organized crime. I mean, it, it's a level of threat that, that most smaller MSPs certainly just aren't, aren't aware of and don't know how to, how to properly address. So it, it's, a, it's a rapidly moving situation. It's very fluid, it's very iterative, and it, it's, it's very real. Yeah, it's almost like the year 2022 is the year where everything's happening. And so there's so much for these uh, bad actors to take advantage of, you know, whether it's a stimulus payment yep. going out or whether it's a PPP loan for a small business, they're not short of topics that they can try and fish someone on um, for sure. I mean, and you even called out some of the societal stuff that's happening as well. I mean, it's, uh, it's easy pickings almost depending on what these, these uh, threat actors want to do. Yeah. Yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, I think when we were prepping for this, the mobile banking one, you know, it's one of those, you think about it, I, I guess, yeah, people are using more mobile banking. It's not like they're going to the bank, right? And you start right. to look at uh, all the different things that have changed again because of, of the new um, normal. You know, the one as I was looking through some of the notes was, you know, scare tactics in healthcare. You could imagine, you know, threat actor sending an email. Were you at this location? Well, you were exposed, right? And the sheer right. um, fear that that can stoke and in, in, in people, whether it was true or not, um, it's kind of uh, crazy that, the, you know, that's where this is headed uh, and us being able to be smart enough to identify it and, and track it. Um, and yeah. we did have it. There's just such a need to verify now. You can't yep. take, you know, even the most legitimate source of information, you can't accept anymore. You have to fact check and triple fact check. And, you know, even, even just earlier this week, there was a, oh, what day did it hit? Was it Monday, I think? You know, there was, there was a supposed coordinated distributed denial of service attack across the internet. And, you know, it quickly spiraled up and there was all kinds of chatter about it. And then it's looking like it was just a misconfiguration in some routing tables with one uh, mobile phone network carrier that just kind of propagated and caused some mischief, but nowhere near the level that, that a lot of people bit into right away as being, oh my God, we're under attack. Um, you just, you, you can't take anything as fact until you do your homework now. No, that's totally true. Very, very true. Um, Aaron, let's do this. I did verify just to fact check too, as I was like, Hey, how many emails do we process a day? I did look it up MJ. Cause I know you were questioning that as I, look, I said that on the other slide, yeah. we're almost at half a billion emails processed a day. So I'm, a, I'm right. If I say it's a 48 hour period, we see almost a billion emails. So that's where that research is coming from. When I give you those different topics of, we saw this, we saw that. It's uh, we see a few emails. Thankfully, um, no one has to read those. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, Aaron. Yeah, perfect. And so what MJ and I wanted to talk about is a little bit about, you know, what, what are MSPs doing now that people are remote? What are the conversations that you're having with um, your end users? Then we'll transition over into what are things that you can do for the businesses that you work with on the security side? And then we'll go over to one of my favorite topics, which is practice what you preach. And what are some of the things that MSP sh should be doing? And, and so, you know, I open it up as well to the attendees. You know, if there's something that you have drastically changed um, in the last 90 days because of what's happening, you know, feel free to throw it into the question or the chat. And, and we'd love to hear it and, and, and talk about it with MJ. Um, but we'll go through what, what kind of we have here um, prepared. So Aaron, let's go to the next slide. And so MJ, this is, this is, this is, you know, I'll go through this, but th this is really, you know, the, the Q and A for you really, because you're, you're on, we're on the front lines for so many years in many different roles on, on the MSP side. Right. And so, you know, when we talk about security, you know, a lot of vendors, look, we do it with MSPs, but there's a bench knowledge of cybersecurity. And yes, I think a lot of small businesses have come up to speed over the years, you know, on even I joke with my family and picking them all the time, but you know, is this a real email or not a real email? Is this really from Amazon or is it not? Um, and so their, their knowledge is increasing as well. I mean, they, they have to, but when we talk about approaching customers about security, you know, there's different strategies, right? And, um, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll throw it to you, MJ, as kind of the first question is, 
you know, what worked for you uh, at the various different MSPs um, when you started to talk about, talk to customers about security, you know, it was that one go-to kind of conversation. Sure. So, I mean, I, I think that the, the real key here, Neil, is you've got to, you've got to be able to talk to their level. You've got, you've got to bring it to them in plain, understandable English. I think that one of the, you know, one of the mistakes we make, and, and let's face it, most of us are technologists by trade. We talk techie and, and we lose the customer. So you, you've got to, you've got to be able to talk about it in ways that resonate for the individual customer. So you just have to figure out what that is. Um, and that's, that's, you know, in many respects, that's relationship management 101. But then, you know, that notwithstanding, with most small businesses anyway, and even, even some of the, the larger, you know, mid-sized companies, you also have to kind of drag them kicking and screaming sometimes, right? Um, you know, everybody talks a good game around cyber and says that they want to do the right thing. But when push comes to shove, very few do. Um, you know, most don't set a budget anywhere close to what it should be to address it. And, and a lot of SMBs and, and frankly, a lot of MSPs are still trying to approach it, you know, on the cheap. And, and, and let's face it, it's, it's not an inexpensive proposition, but it, it also doesn't have to break the bank. So you've got to find, you've got to find a happy medium. And, and one, of the, one of the ways we were successful um, in a couple of the organizations with that was, you know, developing a tiered offering that a customer could relate to. So we would oftentimes bake some of the core into our managed service offerings. You know, I mean, you know, we, we, we've been a, we've been a partner back to the, well, I'm, I'm putting on about three different hats right now, but oh, oh, over those, over those years, you know, I and we were partners of Barracuda MSP and Tronus before, and, and we baked a lot of those core services into our core managed services so that we delivered what we would often refer to as a, a foundational level of security. So we've got your endpoint, you know, covered and monitored and protected. We've got your email protected. We've got your data protected. But then we would start to move up a stack. And so we had you know, what we would refer to, as I said, our security fundamentals, and then we would have our security essentials or our advanced security, and then we would have our compliance um, security offering. So we did it in three tiers, and we did that by design. So, you know, the core services, as I said, were baked into the managed services. Then we would talk about more advanced security. You know, do they need email encryption? Do they need archiving and discovery, DLP? Um, IDS, IPS on the firewalls, on you know DNS filtering, cybersecurity training, and and we we t we tuned that up over the years. We brought the um, we brought the DNS filtering and and some of the cybersecurity training, for example, back down into our fundamental package because we felt it was it was so critical to the basic security posture. If a client wasn't willing to invest at that level, they weren't a good client for us. And then we would go all the way up to, to compliance services where we were doing pen tests and vulnerability tests and layering in a SIM and a SOC to really analyze the traffic and, and change management and whatnot. But, you know, you break it up into more relatable chunks, if you will, and it becomes less daunting of a conversation with the customer. Yeah, I mean, it's also like acronym soup, right? I think yep. just in that description, you gave probably seven acronyms or more. <laughs> Which I hate. And, 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 the and, end user, right? and the end user is looking at you like, what did you just say? You have to be careful, right? You, you absolutely do. And you made a, you made a great point, And it, it's pretty funny. You make a really good point. Because I, I was speaking with someone about a week or so ago. And um, they made the comment that most MSPs don't know how to spell SOC, let alone what it means. <laughs> And I think, you know, that that's probably a whisker unfair. <laughs> it is. Um, it is. It's a little cruel. I don't, I don't necessarily agree. <laughs> it's a little cruel. I think I agree. I think, I think most MSPs know what a SOC is, but, but maybe they don't truly understand what the role of a SOC is in a, in a, in a, you know, well thought out comprehensive cybersecurity offering. But to your point, 
you've got to make it relatable to the customer. So if you go in there talking about SIM, SOC, and MDR, and IPS, IDS, and all the acronyms I threw out, it's no different than having those early MSP conversations. They're, they're just going to glaze over and tune you out. Yeah. You've got to talk about what it means to them. You've got to make it relatable. You know, are you think- concerned about preventing attacks on your network perimeter that would you know, look to poke holes and find the unlocked door. If you are, then we need to layer that kind of security in. If you've got compliance requirements, we've got to have the tools to read the massive amounts of data to determine if you're experiencing probing either based on geography or, you know, I, you know, just rogue IPs or, you know, whatever. Again, it's hard to get, it's hard to avoid the lingo, but you have to find a way to avoid the lingo. Yeah, one of the one of the ways that I know the MSP team at Barracuda MSP has done it in the past, or even tried to educate, you know, uh, partners is you know relating cybersecurity to physical security, alarm systems, windows, doors, door yeah. locks, those type of things. And it sounds basic, but but it kind of works uh, most of the time. And a lot of on the education side is always you know the always tip I have was story based, right? Um, you know, for me, it's scary. You go to a, a trade show and you raise your hand and you're like, how many MSPs in the room have had a customer that have wired money to the wrong person? And right. scarily enough, most people will raise their hand, you know, to the point where, you know, you go to an accountant nowadays and, you know, I, I go to my accountant, you know, they had a bookkeeper, you know, that was almost fished, right? It's not that hard. You look at, you know, the shark tank uh, t- person there that ended up having someone that yep. transferred and it's so easy um, and scary how easy I should say how easy for, the, for that to happen. But the stories, you know, usually seem to work too or the example based. And if that doesn't work, just tell them what their competitor is doing because they'll want to keep up. Um, yeah, very much you know, agreed. I, I, I think um, one of the questions that comes up and, you know, I prepped you for all of 30 seconds on this one was <laughs> – MSPs that are maybe moving into security or evolving their security stack. You know, you mentioned there are multiple different levels with different things, you know, foundational, advanced, comprehensive. That reminds me of all the work we do at CompTIA to kind of educate the partners. But, you know, how do you answer the, the question from the small business? Well, I thought you were doing that already. I pay you one price per user. It's supposed to be all inclusive. Why do I got to go and upgrade my security? I, I thought you were doing it. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's a fair question. And I think that's where MSPs have done themselves perhaps a little disservice over the years because they've oftentimes referred to some fairly simple things as cybersecurity services, whether it be, and, and I don't mean simple things in a disparaging way, but you know, just about every MSP includes some amount of backup antivirus and malware and some at least basic spam filtering and a lot have said you know well that'll that'll help keep you secure and as soon as you say the word secure what the customer hears is that you've got them covered and and it's anything but that right um you know to your analogy about you know windows and doors and security systems you know you can build a house but if you don't put windows and doors in, there, there's nothing to prevent anyone from just walking in. And if you do put windows and doors in, well, you've, you've, you've put up a, a, a potential barrier, but if you don't have locks on them, the barrier is not very good. And all that needs to happen is somebody needs to walk up and turn the knob or try and raise the window pane and they find out whether or not they can get in. Then you put locks in and do you put, you know, the cheapest lock you can buy at the local home improvement store, or do you put in a pretty robust lock and then you get to an alarm system? And do you put in one that covers all the windows, doors, motion sensors, temp sensors? Is it monitored? Is it not monitored? Does it have cellular backup? Does it not? It, it's all just different layers of locking things down based on the risk profile that's there or the value that's trying to be protected. And so I think, you know, telling a story to your point is, is a great way to address that. But it's also that, you know, managed services does not equate security. And, and I think a lot of MSPs make a mistake trying to insert another S and pass themselves off pass themselves off as MSSPs. That's a different 
animal. It's a different set of expertise. If you don't have cyber analysts on staff and a CISO and some type of a SOC that you're partnered with or, or run internally, you can't call yourself an MSSP. Um, you can't outsource the whole thing and call yourself an MSSP. Um, you know, there was one company that I worked with, the largest of them, and, and I used to joke and say, you know, we had a firewall between our MSP business and our MSSP business because we did. They were completely separate business units, separate management. One did not talk to the other unless engaged on a project such that if we called in the security division to do an audit and a, you know a true pen vulnerability test they would call us out on anything that was lacking as if we were some third party msp that no one had ever heard of and that and that was the only way to maintain the integrity of that otherwise as one of my biggest and best clients said to me and this is someone i've known for oh crap probably getting on 30 years at this point you know as as this person said to me one time, I can't have the fox watching the hen house. I can't, my board's not going to buy that. And, and so MSPs who try to do it all and be MSSPs oftentimes find themselves in that position. And, and, and you know, unless they structure it really well and really independently, you know, it, it, it could be an issue. So, you know, I, I think it's all about education. You have to educate the customer that, Core MSP services does not equal cybersecurity for the company. I think that that's a lot of good points. And it's actually, you know, the risk point and, you know, uh, the fox in the house there, I mean, it's true. You, you kind of don't want to audit yourself. No auditor would ever accept the self-signed audit. I mean, they would depending on the level, uh, but most, once you get into a certain level, will not. Aaron, let's head to the next slide. And, you know, this is really, you know, what can you offer your customers? And, and we spoke about this, but now let's get into the tactical stuff, some of the nuts and bolts. And some of this has had to be implemented because of the, the new normal and, and COVID-19. You know, when I looked at, um, you know, the ebook for this, I'm sure that a lot of the things we commented in the ebook are still valid, right? How many people went and had to work from home and they couldn't find their post-it note full of passwords because it was because <laughs> it was still at their desk at work right how many of them have an outdated operating system where maybe they're using a computer they had at home versus their work computer um security software that's never updated i don't care the vendor right it's yeah. great but if it's not updated what's the point and then the big one which really comes out to bite a lot of people is um you know old employees still having access yeah. Right. If you look at the sheer number of move ad change requests that our MSP processes, um, you know, that that's a big one. So, I mean, I'll throw it to you, MJ, you know, in your different experiences, you know, if you there's a big list here. But if you had to kind of talk about the top one or two, you know, where, where would you start for what you would offer to an end user? Oh, well, for an end user, I mean, without question email, you know, the top three are really the top three. I mean, there, there, there's no reason not to have multi-factor. And for place. full disclosure, we didn't pay you to say that. No, 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 absolutely not. Um, good point. I mean, I, I could jumble this list a couple different ways, but, but really when I, when I really think about this, the top three are the most important because multi-factor should just be a no brainer. Um, it's the simplest thing you can do that raises your level of defense, you know, exponentially to the cost. Right. And then security awareness training is critical. I mean, we all know this. Um, we know that the vast majority of breaches and incidents happen because somebody did the wrong thing and they need to be trained to think about things differently. They need to be trained to suspect everything until they can prove otherwise. So, you know, security training can't be un underscored enough. And email security is, is you know, it. Listen, if you don't have email security, you built the house and you didn't put any windows or doors in, let alone locks and alarm systems. Um, email is without question the number one threat payload out there. Um, so it only makes sense. Now, could I shift patching in there? Could I shift secure remote access, multi-layered protection? Sure, I could. But I view those as more 
those are those are more behind the scenes things that an MSP brings to the table to add value. The top three are sort of if you're not offering those three things to every single MSP customer and making the case in such a way that they all accept it, you're not doing the right job for your customer. Yeah, um, couple, I think it's that emphatic. I mean, to your point on the security awareness training, whether you charge for it or you're not, it's almost, I always look at it as a way to justify to the person that signs the check that there are risks in the business. There's employees that are going to make mistakes. The flip side is also true where you do need buy-in from the guy that signs the check to make sure that every, all the employees take it. Um, we could probably do an entire webinar on, you know, just how do different MSPs get different employees at different businesses they support to take the awareness training. Um, right. But it does, you know, add value. And, and, you know, if it prevents a couple of those emails that they're sending you, hey, is this spam because they just deleted it, you know, then it was worth all of, the, all, all of that effort. And honestly, yeah. a lot of the different verticals these fo folks and these businesses are in actually require some type of training annually anyway. Right. You know, for right. me, well, the other, the other uh, thing you're seeing is, is there's, there's annually increasing pressure from, the, um, from cyber insurance carriers because they're recognizing the risk of uneducated insureds. And so they're, they're starting to ask more targeted questions about what you do and not just are you doing it, but how do you do it? How do you audit compliance? Things like that. Um, that's becoming more the norm, which is putting pressure back on the end users, which makes the conversation actually easier for the MSP. Yeah, the, the big one, you know, for patching, which is interesting, is I actually, if you look at the sheer number of threats that come in, yes, there's a ton of, you know, social engineering attacks, the Verizon data breach report, a lot of that comes in through email, but kind of that next target there is unpatched yeah. uh, systems, right? And you've even seen Microsoft over the last couple of months was saying like, hello, you need to patch this like now, Zoom, right? If you look at the amount of patches yeah. that Zoom has had over the past three months, um, just by everyone using the platform and beating it up and looking for vulnerabilities, it's insane. So I think from my perspective, I put patching in the normal MSP knock and help desk bucket, but there is huge security implications if it's not done properly and it's not audited and it's not looked at um, properly. And you're probably already doing it as an MSP. You just, it's, it, it's so important. Yep. Agreed. One, one of the things that, you know, if we look at the, the, new normal too. A lot of small business owners that I've always spoken to over the years didn't really want their employees to work remote. I can't see them. I can't watch them. Right. They can't don't know what they're doing. And this has proven that I'm not saying they're as efficient. Maybe they were more efficient. It depends on the business, but this whole idea of secure remote access isn't going away anytime soon. They're going to be in kind of this hybrid type environment. And so for me as an opportunity, as an MSP, just making sure that there's a reliable way for employees of the businesses I support to be able to work either from the office or from home. You know, I've heard some stories on VoIP this or, Vo you know, it did work, didn't work, uh, talking with different MSPs. So I think that is totally an opportunity um, that, that can be taken from this, this webinar and, and move forward, right? It's just, it's going to happen and MSPs kind of need to evaluate their MSP stack to account for it. Yeah, I mean, it's here. It's, it, you know, it, it's here, it's not going away. And it's a huge opportunity for MSPs to extend, you know, look, I don't know many MSPs that want to manage employees home networks, but there's absolutely a great opportunity here to insert MSP services into that home network in an appropriate way where you're only managing the worker and the workers connectivity. Um, so th there's a great business opportunity. Yeah, we need so to keep the we need to keep the machine that they're doing work on socially distanced from the. Yep, right? absolutely. I mean, it's it's pretty much how they got to make it work. Yep, um, yep. And then this is the this is where you were going to go, and we started doing this slide, but I think this one's near and dear. So, Aaron, let's go to the next slide, and this is really what can you do for your MSP, right? Yeah. Less so. Look, there we we need to help our clients. Um, for sure. But if we're not even protecting our own business, you know, as an MSP, we're at risk. Yeah. You know, the big one um, on, on here for me is the secure your tool set. You know, if you look at some of the uh, bulletins that have gone out, and this is a good segue for the end of your presentation with the ISO and everything, um, bulletins that have gone out of people attacking MSP tool sets, 
because they know it's the keys to the kingdom. They get access to that tool set. They can get access to 50 to hundred small businesses. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, is there things that you did in your past life and the different MSPs where, you know, um, that you did that you would do again in a heartbeat in the next MSP or any of these that you would want to call out as, as kind of important? Well, I mean, you know, the practice, what you preach, I, I mean, that should be, I, I mean, I'd like to scroll that across here in like ginormous letters. Um, way too many MSPs do not practice what they preach. They talk a great game, but they don't, they don't do it and they're going to get burned. And, and to your point, you know, the, the, the hacking of MSPs that we've seen and, and worse, you know, leveraging that activity to then attack a broad set of clients is a massive issue and it, and it, 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 it runs the risk of doing irreparable harm to this business that we're all so fortunate to, to be part of. So it, it is, you know, back to my earlier comment about existential threats, MSPs are an existential threat to themselves because they're not practicing what they preach and they're not keeping their own systems up to date. How many MSPs are using like, oh, our firewall just, you know, our firewall's old. Let's use the firewall we just took out of this customer. What? Come on. Um, you know, you should be setting the standard. You should have consistent stacks. You should train your employees just like you tell your customers to. You know, securing the tool set? Absolutely. I mean, how many MSPs don't even pay attention to their own tools. They, they make sure that they're patching their customers and monitoring their customers, but they're not doing it for themselves. It, it's, it's negligent, no, no question about it, but it, it, it's, it's downright scary. Um, and it, it, it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue, unless, especially for smaller MSPs who are stretched. I mean, look, I get it. Not everybody has the resources to have a team of cyber analysts and a CISO and, and, the tools watching everything, but, you know, absolutely, you know, multi-factor was one of the first things we implemented multi-factor and single sign on as best we could, because think about your average tech and how many different portals they log into to manage things. Now, some of that's because they don't have a choice. Some of it's because the MSP hasn't properly integrated things into a single pane of glass so that they can restrict that. But, I can tell you from firsthand experience without revealing names, how many systems people could get into six plus months after they'd left an MSP. That's unacceptable. That, I mean, that is just a level of threat that is so easy to prevent. Um, and it's because things get out of control with, with having too many tools in some cases. So, you know, closely managing this and, and, you know, documenting your own environments and putting in the practices that, again, it, it's all about practice what you preach and it touches on every single one of these bullets, if not more so. Uh, it's critical. It's absolutely critical. And the one, I mean, whether it's single sign-on multi-factor or multi-factor with a password manager type stuff, you know, a lot of that can prevent kind of lost credentials, even just knowing what. Yeah what an employee had access to because a lot of the solutions out there uh, track the, the, that type of thing. And you'd kind of know where they were spending their time and what they were using credentials uh, for, you know, and when yeah. we say put safeguards in place, you know, this is basic stuff, endpoint protection, email protection, firewalls, which, you know, you mentioned, you know, using a uh, kind of donated firewall, which doesn't really sound like a good idea. The, the one point I will bring up is partner, right? Um, yeah. And whether you want to build it by, you know, partner, I'd say nowadays the ecosystem is so large. I, I'd be shocked if there's not a lot of MSPs that are partnering for something, right? Just one thing. And, you know, so leveraging kind of the experts and figuring out how to put that as part of your service offering for me, I think is a huge advantage, you know, just because you might have one client that needs a full blown sock, you don't have to go build a sock or try and cobble together a sock. Right. There are vendors out there that are experts at SOC or, you know, if somebody needs to do threat hunting because of the compliance that they're out of, uh, they have on their business or the rules, there are companies that you can partner with that can do that without you having to go and invest in 
you know, very expensive humans to be able to do that, at least to get started and, and add value to your customer. So I always bring that up. You know, there's a ton of, you know, different organizations out there that MSPs can partner with. Um, and to your point, MJ, that separation is important, right? You don't want someone doing the managed services also doing the security. You know, how do you audit one side versus the other side? Um, of the business. So it's important. I, I don't know if, if, if you had any comments or, you, you know, experiences partnering uh, on the security side. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, partnering is key. It's no, no question about it. I mean, we, we built, you know, we built each of the MSPs that I was involved with were built based on best in class partnerships. And, and, you know, as I said earlier, and, and this isn't, this isn't brown nosing, this is just a fact, you know, Barracuda MSP was, was a key part for each of them. Um, and for a reason, because, you know, you represent a best in class partner, um, the resources that you provide, the technology, the support behind it, the education behind it, things like this, you know, you guys do it right. And there are many other companies that do it right as well. Some are your competitors, some aren't, but, you know, finding a partner, you know, you, you don't want to partner with everybody under the sun. You want to find the partners that that are the right partners for you and leverage the heck out of that because it makes you a better msp and it, and it allows you to deliver more value to the customer and at the end of the day the customer needs to perceive value from the services that you're offering and so you you can't just try to be be everything for the customer there are going to be points where you don't have that expertise that's where you look to partner and and partner smart and it will come back and pay dividends. Very cool, awesome. Well, we, well, 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 let's do this. Let's transition now to kind of your new initiative, your kind of new passion that you're kind of going down the path of. You know, I'm a huge fan of CompTIA. Um, I've been involved for, I don't even know how many years, various roles. I mean, you've had way more roles at CompTIA than me. I, I think the board, <laughs> yeah. all sorts of stuff. So I don't need to basically be an ambassador for CompTIA with you on the line, um, but happy to, happy to do so. Um, what is the CompTIA ISAO? What, what's this all about? Sure. So, I mean, a couple things. One is the, 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 the power and the strength of CompTIA are people like you. It's the volunteer leaders that come to the table. And, and you know, you and the work you've done in the IT security community has been so much, you know, so much more than you as an individual or the company that you work for. You, you've helped create programming and tools and education that, that are influencing the world. And, and that's, what's, that's what's so amazing about CompTIA. It's a global nonprofit trade association. So the people that are involved and passionate about it check their business card at the door and do what's best for the industry. Um, and that's what makes it such a unique and powerful organization and, and, and why what it does and, and whether it's education, research, certifications, their events, that's why they're so... Um, so good and why you see a more mature type of, of MSP and vendor around them because it, it, it's reflective of the culture of the organization. So, you know, the CompTIA ISAO and ISAO is an information sharing and analysis organization. It's something that was chartered under the Department of Homeland Security several years ago. There, there are some that are called ISACs, which the C stands for center, whereas the O stands for organization. ISACs are, tend to be organized around critical infrastructure, utilities, healthcare, financial services, et cetera. ISAOs tend to be a little broader based in, in their appeal. What's interesting is there's never been one focused on the MSP part of our industry and the channel part of our industry. And so um, back in August of 2019, um, Arnie Bellini, who was one of the co-founders of ConnectWise, after he sold the company, formed something called the Bellini Better World Foundation. And he's, he's you know, on a smaller scale, he, he's, he's trying to do what, what Bill and Melinda Gates have done with the Gates Foundation. He's trying to influence the world for, for good. And I give, him, I give him a ton of credit for that. Um, and so he... Um, he put up some initial seed funding to create an ISAO for our space in the industry. And originally, he, um, he recruited ConnectWise to provide some logistical support to get it stood up. And, and then it became clear pretty quickly that it needed a lot more than ConnectWise or Arnie could do on their own. And so 
Comtia was approached about taking it over because as a nonprofit global trade association, it really just made sense that it that this is where it sat. And so I had been recruited to become the executive director of, of this. And, and so I was intimately involved in the discussions to move it over to Comtia and Comtia has embraced it. And we've really revamped the whole program. And at the end of the day, what the mission of the Comtia ISAO is, is to raise the cybersecurity resilience of the global technology provider market. So our mission is to help MSPs become more cyber secure and do it without having to create or understand the whole cybersecurity landscape. So this is all about sharing threat intelligence and doing it in a way, in a way that's understandable and actionable. So as an example, if an MSP it you know uses Kaseya's RMM and Datto's PSA and Barracuda's backup, you only want to see alerts related to those platforms. You don't care about the ConnectWise PSA platform or SolarWinds RMM or eFolders backup if you're not using it. So part of this is going to be about targeting threat intelligence so that you know it's relevant. The other part of it is putting it in plain English to understand what the threat is and what you need to do to protect your MSP and your customers. And then, you know, what I've been saying, if you're old enough to understand the, the phrase above the fold and below the fold, it's an old newspaper analogy. You know, the, the, the headline grabbing news goes above the fold and the, the detail goes below the fold. And so we wanna put the plain English analysis above the fold and then provide all the cybersecurity jargon below the fold so that if you're interested in it or if you have a cyber analyst on staff and you want to do some of your own threat hunting you can but we're going to do that for you and provide you with you know just a simple hey there's a vulnerability in x product this is what the vulnerability means this is how to fix it this is what the impact could be on your business this is what the impact could be on your customer's business and here's how to keep yourself safe it's that simple. And, and the reason why MSPs don't belong typically to ISACs or ISAOs is because they typically do that from the perspective of a cyber analyst with all the corresponding acronyms and lingo that I could throw at you that, that you know, most MSPs don't understand. So we're gonna make it understandable and make it so that you can be more secure because we feel as the Industry Trade Association that we've got a responsibility to help make MSPs safer, or they're gonna to continue to get hacked and there's gonna be irreparable damage done to the business. So it's all about the bullets on the screen. We'll, there'll be a forum where there can be interactive discussions about sharing best practices. There'll be events and opportunities to build connections and trust between members. There'll be tons of industry insight from research and education that CompTIA has the ability to focus on this. We've got some partnerships with some you know, household name organizations that are gonna help make this information very rich and very actionable. And, um, and I believe this is going to be a game changer for the industry. So um, you, know, you can learn more about it at comptiaisau.org. You, um, you can join for free right now for the rest of the year at membership. And uh, there'll be a full formal relaunch at ChannelCon between August 4th and 6th. And I know you guys will be part of, of the virtual ChannelCon event as well. But you know, if, if, you are, if you're an MSP and you don't sign up for this right now, you are not taking security seriously. So um, you know, it's, a, it's a simple thing to do and it, it's gonna just bring tremendous, I, I wish, I wish this was around when I had my MSP. I could have taken my MSP in all kinds of new and exciting directions with this kind of support behind it. So this this is this is going to be just just tremendous. And 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 I thank you for the opportunity to share it and and you know for your personal support of it. And uh, and yeah, it, it's you know it, it's going to make a considerable difference in how MSPs are perceived in the marketplace moving forward. Awesome. No, we're, we're um, happy to, you know, ha have you present about this today. And um, for me on the security executive council, it pretty much comes up uh, every, every meeting. So <laughs> yeah. it is top of mind and uh, 
we uh, hopefully uh, help drive Comtia to get this uh, get this launched. And for those that don't know, you know, MJ mentioned it, but you know, ChannelCon's virtual this year. So if there's any Comtia members on the line, um, point your favorite web browser over to Comtia.org, and you can register for the virtual uh, ChannelCon. Well, awesome. Yeah. I, I, that that's our content um, today. I, I think Aaron. I think we're handing it back to you to kind of wrap it up. Yep, yep. We're gonna be cognizant of everyone's time. As we know, we're all wearing multiple hats from you know parenting and educating and, and working all this at the same time in the same place. So um, yep, we're gonna go ahead and wrap it up. Um, here are some things you can do next. We do have a cybersecurity ebook that is readily available on our resources page. Um, we just had a new um, article come out on Smart MSP about learning about the emerging trends within cybersecurity. And then obviously go ahead and get involved with that CompTIA ISAO. Uh, we're very excited. Uh, we will be a part of CompTIA virtual event. I'm getting excited to put our virtual booth together and get Neil involved and have him hang out online with me all day and answer questions. So it should be a good time. But um, we want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at any time. We'll be able to answer those for you. Um, we hope you have a great rest of the week, and we look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Thank MJ. You. Thanks, everybody.